Hey everybody, we're back. It's Alice Preci, the co-founder and creator of the Fertility Answers app. And Dr. Serena Chen is just about to join me. This is going to be an Ask Me Anything. We realize that we've been coming to you with topics already in mind and we receive such a flurry of questions and activity from our community that we want to make sure that today is as relevant as possible for you. And then also it will allow us the opportunity to make sure that we can carve out, you know, future shows for what you want us to cover. Hi, Serena. Hi, how are you doing? As a reminder, Dr. Chen is an REI, a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist out of IRMS in Northern New Jersey. She is a wealth of information and so educational and inspirational. She's available to answer your questions on the Fertility Answers app but we love to communicate and engage with our, with our audience. So we wanted to do this, ask me anything. What we have found over the last couple times in, in actually reaching out to the Instagram community is people have questions about fibroids, about endometriosis, PCOS, you know, we're, we're heading into um, a season where we will, we will cover next month in September topics about the flu shot. Um, we don't want you to get it too early. So we actually decided not to cover that today. Um, it, we will be able to cover it uh, next month. And my own personal story, in case it's the first time that you've heard from me, is that 12 and a half years ago, I was diagnosed and treated for breast cancer when I was in my early 30s. I was able to successfully preserve my fertility, and as a result, I have an almost seven-year-old son. He's also a donor-conceived baby, yes, although not much of a baby now. So, you know, it is definitely not much of a baby, definitely a success story, and Serena helps people with egg freezing. Um, why don't you tell them a little bit about what you've been dealing with even last week with some of your patient stories? So, I... Um... You know, it's been it's been very very busy. I I feel like a lot of a lot of infertility patients are now um, that before the pandemic were like, well, I don't really know if I want treatment. Maybe I just want testing. I'm not really sure. I want to do IUI or IVF. Let's just see what happens. And now um, I'm seeing that a lot of people are like. I think I need to do IVF right now. And um, and I think that people are realizing. Um, you know, I, it's not a study, but I'm seeing a lot of people say, um, is that a bird? In the it is a bird. Sorry, everybody. Okay. But <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to hear her. She can be yes, really now loud. I hear it now that we're on Instagram, but <laughs> she's a very yippee, but, but I think people are feeling like a sense of, well, now with the pandemic, I've realized what's really important to me and what's not. And I realized having a family is super important. And I want to move forward with that now in the most kind of efficient, aggressive way possible, which kind of makes sense. If you think right. about like um, how many visits it would take with IUI to yield the same pregnancy as, as the same number of visits with IVF, that probably the... Um, the amount of time and the amount of exposure to the doctor and things like that um, might be actually less with IVF, even though IVF can be mm -hmm. more intense because the per cycle pregnancy rate is five to 10, maybe even high, more fold, like so much higher than IUI and so much more efficient that perhaps you are, you know, having less exposure ultimately. We know the cost per baby, if you look at a whole group, not just one individual person, but a whole group of people, the cost per baby for, I, for IVF tends to be significantly lower because the pregnancy rate per cycle is so much higher, even though the cost of IVF- At one time. IVF, yeah, yes. tends to be hot, a, a higher upfront cost. I, so, you know, I can absolutely I say sense. it does. I mean, for, for me, it definitely has impacted and made me feel like the pressure of, I really can't really wait. I mean, I'm 44 and I have been holding off for quite a while and doing the second embryo transfer. My kids are going to be so far apart, you know, fingers crossed that another so embryo transfer works. From, these are made from eggs at what age? So when I was 31. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're nice and young. 
But these I just don't want to be, I don't want to be pregnant when I'm 50. Yeah. I mean, then my, you know, I'm going to be 75 and my kid's 25. I mean, you start, you know, thinking about all those things. Yeah, that's, true. <laughs> that's just me. I, you know, there's lots of healthy, you know, moms at 50 who are doing egg donation and having success. Yeah. I, I just don't, didn't picture myself that way. I yeah. we do have a question in here from um, Akhtiar. I hope I said that correctly. She said today she got an egg rupture injection. When should I try for intercourse? I'm not sure what that is. What's I an egg rupture injection? Trigger shot. I think that's oh, just trigger a shot. Pop. Yeah. Yeah. Shot. So um, usually, you know, if you haven't started to surge at all, usually now is a good time to have intercourse once you have the shot because, like, we're kind of having then you kind of have sperm in the fallopian tube waiting for the egg. So usually, I'll say like the day of the trigger shot and maybe the day after. Theoretically the trigger shot will release the egg within 36 hours. And then the egg will be fertilizable for another 24 hours after release. But during an IUI cycle, a lot of times people will might release the egg a little bit earlier because they've already started to surge on their own. Right. So, um, so I would talk to your doctor and, and your nurse, but it doesn't have to be super precise. I mean, you know, you could have sex today and tomorrow, and I think that would be fine. Well, and, and bear in mind that sperm can live up to five days in our bodies. And so it's more of a concern of missing the window, less of a concern yes. uh, about being a day or two early, Yeah, especially yeah. if you have really healthy, healthy numbers, right? Yeah. So we have another question from Mrs. Jem, Jem Elvin or Jem Elvin. Okay. Is there a natural supplement you can recommend to aid, aid conception? So, um, well, we want everybody to be taking prenatal vitamins. So we do want you to take folate, um, because that's uh, fo supplemental folic acid or folate is recommended by the FDA for all pre uh, all women in the United States who are trying to conceive or pregnant to reduce the risk for neural tube defects. It's possible it might also reduce the risk for autism and schizophrenia. If you are um, have a high BMI or overweight, then your doctor might want to take want you to take more, so you have to talk with them. We, in the Northeast, I, I don't really know what it's like in the South or Southwest or things like that, but in the Northeast, we do have a vitamin D3 epidemic and the normal prenatal vitamins don't have enough vitamin D3 in them and D3 is important for many bodily functions and also uh, for a healthy baby because um, D deficiency could actually lead to issues with the baby. So D3 is important. You might, um, I put my patients on extra D3 over and above the prenatal because they live in the Northeast. And then I check their levels. And if they're low, then I add even more. Um, so a lot of people, I think a lot of obstetricians like people to take at least a thousand extra a day, but that sometimes that depends on your region and your levels. Um, I think all of us in the United States tend to have not enough omega-3s in our diet. So uh, fresh seafood, eight to 12 ounces of fresh seafood a week um, will fulfill your omega-3 requirements. But I think that's hard to do on a regular basis. You can do it um, if you don't have seafood, if you're like vegetarian through chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, hemp hearts, things like that. Uh, but if you don't are not conscious about getting the um, omega-3s, uh, which are important for your health and the baby's development, then you might consider some omega-3 supplementation like flaxseed oil or fish oil or something like that. Just make sure anything with fish is low mercury. So when we say fresh seafood, you want, we're not talking about shark, which is kind of high mercury. You want to, you want to make sure and look at the ACOG site for safe fish or safe seafood. Um, I think a lot of people are not getting enough calcium. Uh, cal uh, people don't drink as much cow's milk as before. So you want to look at your diet for calcium. It's relatively like D3 is hard to get in your diet, but calcium is much easier by eating a healthy diet. It's hard to get D3 naturally. So those are all things that I think about yeah, automatically. There's, there's literally just no amount of mushrooms that you can eat to get enough D3. And during right. the pandemic, when everybody spent so much more, I mean, I think we're still spending more time indoors, yeah. you know, and then in certain parts of the country, if you're facing hurricane season or like me in California, fire season, we're inside even more. And so I probably all of us are pretty low in D right now. 
yeah. I would assume. I, now we've got some other questions coming in that require definitely some conversation around them. So I'm going to go in order. We have okay. Dobby Chronicles asked after an IVF pregnancy miscarriage first. We're so sorry to hear that it happened at six weeks. Um, she wants to know how soon should they jump back into another transfer? So I, again, obviously you're going to talk to your doctor, but I feel like it usually takes one or two months at the very least to, tr to get your body back. I don't go by a particular time limit. I go by, is your beta level down to zero? And once it's down to zero, I like to check the inside of the uterus. Usually with a saline sonogram, that's like one of the most sensitive, super easy tests that can, you know, it just takes five minutes in the office. It's not uncomfortable. It's not painful. It might be a little bit crampy where we just put a little salt water in the uterus, do an ultrasound while we're putting the salt water in, and we can really get a great view of the inside of the uterus. Five to 10% of pregnancies do leave behind some debris that like maybe like a little piece of placenta or a little piece of the lining that for some reason makes the lining bumpy and that can increase the risk for your next pregnancy of possibly poor implantation which can affect the pregnancy so i would say you know and that usually takes one to three months to get to that point so not a long time so that's hopeful not if they're if they're ready and emotionally make sure that you're ready and that you know if you have a reproductive psychologist at the clinic that you work with that you have the emotional support to deal with that loss. I myself have been through five uh, losses at around that same stage, six and seven weeks. And um, there's lots of people who might say, um, well, it's early, you know, and you didn't have time to get attached. Yeah. And I was attached to every single attached. line. I was yeah. attached immediately that you get that positive, that positive line, you get super emotionally attached and yeah. that's your hope. So um, I, I certainly hope that, um, that, you know, this person has the opportunity to get the emotional support that they need to, to go through that grieving process. We have another one, um, CL Mayfield, uh, who has both stage four endometriosis and PCOS. She's only oh, wow. 32. That's a lot. That's it's a lot. lot. She's going yeah. through a lot. She has a seven and four year old miracle, which um, yay, you know, for awesome. that. Um, but started tracking with ovulation kits. And here's what's interesting. Got an LH surge. So there's a couple things that I feel like in this, um, Dr. Chen, that we should discuss, which is the inadequacy of LH alone for someone with PCOS to use. So let's dive into that topic first. A lot of people, yeah, with PCOS, not everybody, but a lot of PCOS patients, maybe like half of PCOS patients have these very high LH levels a lot of the time so they can t actually turn up positive on these tests without ha actually having an ovulation so it's hard to know is that really a true lh surge because you can kind of see the lh bumping around like this exactly and i think a lot of these kits will show up a positive like right around 15 to 20 and some people with pcos always live there so sometimes it right you're out Right. Now there's two tests that our clinical team has approved for those with PCOS because of this reason. One is OvuSense. They've done clinical uh, validation studies uh, that it, it works best with people with PCOS. So OvuSense is one that our scientific team would advise. The other one is UVA. UVA is a newer test on the market that does measure both your, your ovulation is coming and confirms if ovulation did happen yeah, that's because really they measure both one, LH and progesterone. Do, yeah, they do quantitative measurements yeah. on your urine, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like for you, CL Mayfield, both of those would be a great option. Um, would love for you to check out either one, um, OvuSense or UVA. UVA is so cool because you do check um, every single morning and it is, it does look at your fertility over time. So you get a lot of data about yourself, but in particular, I love that it confirms that magic question that she's asking, does that mean I will actually ovulate or does it mean I actually did ovulate? And that's the part that LH alone can't do. Right. So we have another user that's asking, um, it's Hajra Akhtar again. Thanks for showing up again. We saw you last time. I have hypothyroidism and she's hungry 24 <laughs> seven. I totally understand. So she's worried about gaining lots of weight and sometimes have, have double dinners and snacks and super cute because she did the cover up um, eyes. I mean, you're not alone on that. I mean, we, you know, th this does happen, but I, I think we, you know, fillable snacks that are really healthy is, um, is probably 
Yeah, I probably like to, warranted. I like to remember protein and healthy fats. People, mm-hmm. you know, it's, we're like nuts. I think nut like, nuts. Yeah, yes. low salt nuts. My yeah. favorite. Like I'm really into um, Thrive now. They have all these great packages of shelled, like oh my gosh, shelled pistachio nuts with just a tiny bit of salt because you definitely have to look at your labels, but. Like, boy, that's really yummy. You know, and Trader Joe's, I love for the same reason because they have those. Now, I hate all the plastic, but the individual packages just take all the guesswork out of everything. So I have my my raw cashews. Everywhere. I keep them in my pocket. Me too. It's fantastic. So I love the unsalted raw cashews the most yeah. I oh, love them yeah. so much and so that usually oh please don't be embarrassed Hajra don't be embarrassed at all I have the same issue sometimes I'm on nature throid and uh and yes yeah, sometimes when the, the, the hunger surges happen it's intense I will say too for me it helps to just be proactive uh to get ahead of it so that it doesn't when it happens yeah. you know you don't want to be behind the eight ball when you are hungry yeah, it's like don't, don't go grocery until, shopping when you're hungry right, right? yeah so like try to remember, know your body, because if you get to the point where you're like insanely hungry, then it's very right. hard to control. So like that, that's where the meal planning and the snack planning can be helpful. And yeah. you don't, it doesn't have to be forever because if you do it, if you work hard and try to get into a routine for a couple of weeks, it'll become like easy after a while because then you'll just be like, okay, I'm grabbing this. I'm going to my day and I'm going to grab these things like set yourself up for success. That's right. That's right. I have noticed too, you kind of have to play with it in the morning to see. It sounds yeah. like for Harjra, it's it's the evening time. That's her trigger time. You know, maybe is, is like, you know, the hardest part and uh, just try, trying different things. For me, if I eat a lot, a lot of protein in the morning, I'm kind of satiated, you know, enough where I'm, I don't need a morning snack. But what I do notice is if I don't have a protein with my lunch and I have a lot of vegetables at lunch, I last week had arugula stuck in my tooth and nobody told me on this. And so talk about embarrassing. And it's because I eat a lot of arugula <laughs> during lunch. And so I do notice that I need that bag of cashews in the afternoon at like three o'clock, you know, so play around with it, but it's the proteins and the healthy fats like avocado oil or an avocado you know, um, I also like, it's just a nice little snack to have on hand, those two and a half, three ounce packets of uh, salmon, wild caught salmon, and on, and same with, uh, with the two nethers, these little individual packets. And I love having them on hand. Of course, my cats try to pounce on me when I open the packets. But you're welcome, uh, Mrs. J. Melvin. I think that, I think I messed it up before. It's Mrs. Mrs. Yes, I think that's her last name. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right, so Ginger's 39. She's had two miscarriages, both in 2020. I'm sorry. That's We're very sorry. Yeah. Yes, and she hasn't had a period since her DNC in April. Is that normal? Um, that's a little bit long. So you definitely, um, first of all, two miscarriages in a row, back to back, the vast like that, majority yeah. of people will be totally fine, but that's, that is the signal to see your doctor, maybe see a specialist about getting the recurrent miscarriage workup. Most people don't have anything serious, but it is, we should, you know, we should check for the possibility of a serious thing. Uh, like getting karyotypes done and checking for antiphospholipid syndrome, check for diabetes, anemia, um, um, thyroid. Thyroid is a big issue. So uh, two miscarriages in a row, the vast majority of the time, it was just a, a lot of bad luck, but we want to make sure there's nothing serious going on. And the reason I, we want to check for karyotypes is something called a balanced translocation where you or your partner might have a rearrangement of the chromosome. So you're totally fine, but um, your eggs or your sperm have um, abnormal chromosomes much more often than normal. And so that can mean you just keep having miscarriage after miscarriage and two miscarriages in a row. That's the time we recommend let's do all this testing. Now, Ginger, were those also spontaneous pregnancies unassisted medically? I, that would also kind of indicate, right, what next steps she should take, because certainly at 39, with, with, if they were two 
um, medically unassisted, you know, through good old fashioned sex, we would recommend that she kind of beeline to get in to see a fertility specialist like Dr. Chen in your area. And if you need us to help you locate one, we have fertility navigators who can do that. If cost is a factor, we can help with financing options as well. So you can just DM us or reach out at navigators at medanswers.com as well. That's such a huge resource, Alice, because I think so many people are, I see so many people and meet so many people online and hear from people on Instagram and Twitter and other places where they're just like, I'm just lost where, how do I find somebody? And, and, you know, this is like a great free resource where you literally know you've done the research. So, you know, who's there and what their, right. what their, what their qualifications are and their exactly. experience. So. And even personality, because we, when, when we get a chance to actually communicate with our user base and, and these, these folks that we're trying to help, you definitely get a sense of who, who would be great, a great fit yeah, for them. That's true. And it's not that's one true. size fits all. And that's why we have 1,700 of you, but 1,700 <laughs> isn't enough. We need more. We need more fellow graduates. Yeah. We also have an MZ valid was told IVF wouldn't work after having a tubal ligation. So it sounds like um, this person got the wrong information because after tubal ligation, IVF is the only option. Is it possible there's something else going on besides a tubal issue? Like, so the tubes are blocked. And when the tubes are blocked, the egg and sperm can't get together. So usually we think IVF is the solution, but perhaps there's something else going on maybe with the eggs or the sperm or something like that. But another reason to maybe talk with the navigator in more detail to just get an idea of how we yeah. could find help for her, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. definitely reach out and give us more details of your story, either privately um, or anonymously on the app or, or through uh, the navigators at myanswers.com email so we can help. It does, if, if that's the only piece of information where you had a tubal ligation, then it sounds like you got the reverse information um, because it's historically IVF would be the best treatment. Now, having said that, if you have IVF coverage and your tubes are tied, a lot of insurance companies will say because your tubes are tied, they would not cover IVF even though you have access to the benefit. So it mm -hmm. sounds like we need more info. I see somebody asking after a miscarriage, is it possible to get pregnant before your beta HCG goes to zero? Yes, it is definitely because as the HCG goes down, then that allows your other levels to come up and you could, a lot of people do, will, will ovulate and that brings on the first normal period after a miscarriage or any pregnancy. And that's how you end up with these really closely spaced pregnancies. I feel like that's a little bit risky. So mm -hmm. I actually tell my patients um, until you're, the coast is clear and we know exactly what's going on, I'd rather we get the beta to zero, check your uterus, so use protection so that you don't get pregnant too soon because it, it can really confuse the picture and possibly right. increase the risks. Right. Um, our, our user CL Mayfield uh, mentioned, I, th I think um, she was saying just to clarify that she hadn't had a positive LH surge in a few months, but just did, which could be a good sign. But I think it goes back to again, in PCOS patients using LH only can be very tricky on knowing if it's meaningful or not, because it, it, it can tend to be all over the place. Well, so we can look two weeks after this positive LH surge, you can check a pregnancy test. If you're not pregnant and you don't get a period, then that might mean it wasn't a real ovulation. So um, that's one thing to check, but obviously it would be good to get like a progesterone level in a few days. If you saw an LH surge, that would be nice to get. We also have a user, our, uh, these are great questions, everybody. So thank you for being thank so engaging. Um, Abora Cool Love. I love these, these handles. I just wish I could hear all the stories behind how people come up with their handles that they use on Instagram. Mine is so boring. It's Alice Krishi. <laughs> and it's, she says, at 41, what do you think I can do to increase my chances at IVF working? They had three cycles already and it hasn't worked. She did have an IVF daughter at 36. Um, this might be a good opportunity to bring up Dr. Raquel and working with a naturopath, acupuncture. I mean, there's some integrated approaches that we would support. Um, but what are some of the data points that you would look at specifically knowing that three cycles 
at 41 and she still hasn't achieved success, what else would you do? I think um, sometimes from it, it might be, it might be reasonable time to, you know, like, uh, like another, another opinion and, you know, like maybe talk to you guys and see like maybe her doctor is good, but it might be a pre fresh perspective. Sometimes it's helpful changing the stimulation, thinking about trying to recruit more eggs. Um, a lot of times I will think about doing things like CoQ10 and DHEA and acupuncture, although not so much acupuncture now during the pandemic, um, which there's a little bit of data for not much risk, possibly some benefit and, and then, um, you know, healthy lifestyle is, is it possible that, you know, just taking better care of yourself and being a little healthier and being a little bit less stressed would help you tolerate the medications better and therefore give you another response. And sometimes people just need to try again. Like if, you know, if you had a good mm -hmm. response and the embryos look good, um, it, you do have to generate more embryos to get to the normal embryo for at 41 than you would at right. a younger age. So, and there is that big UK study showing that even after five failed retrievals, people doing a six retrieval still had a, a, a good pregnancy rate. So some, and especially at 41, sometimes it does require multiple tries. It is, it, it requires a lot of endurance. So my heart goes out for you for even enjoying three. I've often said that Mine are so spaced out, you know, I started when I was 31, got to make the embryos and have some unfertilized eggs stored still, but then I didn't do a, a, an, an FET for five years. And so I had this giant break in yeah. kind of treatment and medications and the whole thing. And now I have a seven year break in doing any of that before I'm gearing up for the next one. So I feel like I haven't had to have the endurance that some people have had when they do three and four and five and six back to back cycles. I mean, my heart goes out to you and my just acknowledgement for, you know, for the fortitude that it really takes. Yeah. I will also say there's some things in California that, you know, we face environmentally that probably in other pockets of the country they face too. And I don't think it's talked about very often, but there, we do have some videos on this and that's environmental toxins. Yeah. So in, in Bakersfield, you know, it's all farmland and they've been spraying fertilizer on that land for all the farms for a very long time. And there is just a very high rate of infertility that's due to environmental toxicity. And so, so Alice, how do you yeah. address that? Is that like, is that, that where you think about going organic and stuff like that? Well, heavy metal detoxing. Yeah. So that's where Dr. Raquel, you know, our naturopathic MD who is integrated with um, specialty fertility care really comes into play because she'll first take a look at what those heavy metals are and then work on a detox plan. And okay. it could include like infrared sauna for six months. It could include supplements that help detox. You know, she can look at the detox mechanism, make sure people can detox, drink enough water, surprisingly. How many people are because dehydrated? You're just flushing things out. You're yeah, like just to flush things out to help your liver, help your kidney, right. you know, flush those things out. Um, it's it's actually nuts too. She um she was looking at some patients in Southern California. You know, we eat a lot of sushi here. Yes. A lot, a lot of sushi. Yeah. And, she, and she has found very high levels of mercury in some of her patients that she wow. helped clean up before they did an egg retrieval, before they did their, their next round with great success. So some of it's just that, you know, some of it's cleaning up gut microbiome as well um, that gets impacted by those environmental toxins as well. I'm, I'm definitely not the, um, not the expert on those areas, Neither but we, we do have a lot of content yeah. on, um, you know, on those types of things when people ask about prepping for, um, you know, for another round when, you know, age is already stacked against us. I'm 44 doing an embryo transfer and I'm concerned about the same things as if I was getting an, an egg retrieval, even though these docs have successfully done frozen embryo transfers on grandmas who've offered, who, who have been surrogates, you know, for their, their daughters or their daughter-in-laws. So even though they're so good at that, I still want my host environment to be the healthiest, oh, cleanest huge. environment that, that it can that, be. That makes a huge difference. That's the epigenetics and right. it, it kind of directs how the genes are function. So that matters enormously. Yes. Right. So I think that's right. Fine. Now we do have someone, um, Katrina Boo, who is having no cycles. So why don't we address that for a moment when you're not ovulating, you're not, or you're not having periods. So the assumption is you're not ovulating. Right. Uh, then yeah. what are some options that Katrina should be looking at 
So three things uh, that it could be. Um, the most common is that you have eggs, but your hormones are just a little out of whack because of possibly insulin resistance from polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's the number one diagnosis for irregular periods. Other than um, you definitely have to make sure you're not pregnant. So if this is like something new for you, you should check a, a pregnancy test. But beyond pregnancy, PCOS is the most common cause for irregular periods. The, the second most common might be, well, they're both not so common, but premature ovarian failure and something called hypothalamic amenorrhea, where you're not making the brain hormones to release the eggs in the ovary or premature ovarian, um, primary ovarian insufficiency or insufficiency. premature insufficiency. ovarian insufficiency, POI, where right. your, your eggs, your, your, um, your eggs are, are um, you just don't have that many eggs. And so the brain hormones are working fine, but the ovaries are not responding. So it could be that number one PCOS, where there's just a disconnect, not like um, miscommunication between the brain and the ovaries hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is a lack of uh, hormones from the brain that can't stimulate normal ovaries, or a problem with the ovaries, but the brain hormones are fine. Great, great. And we have Haley Nicole, who's asking a question about male infertility that I love, because her husband has an extremely low sperm count. And to me, there's some a, a couple pieces of good news in that, that he's got some sperm. Yes. That is good. So, so that's good. And the second, the second piece that I, I want to make sure everybody always knows about sperm is that since men rejuvenate their sperm every three and a half months, there's a very short window to improve things and check to see if you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And if, if, if Haley, Nicole is young enough, then they've got some time to really kind of focus on what are the things that can improve those sperm counts as long as there's nothing genetic that is causing, um, that is causing the extremely low sperm counts. It's not a life sentence, but um, let's talk about the, some so lifestyle first thing, all, factors first before going to stop like- your, the, If you're on testosterone, you gotta stop because yeah. testosterone oh, yeah, that's will one. <laughs> get rid of, um, will tell your testic testes to stop making sperm. So that's very, very important. If you have a testosterone deficiency, you need a really good medical endocrinologist, maybe a good urologist so that you can replace the testosterone in a safe way that's good for the sperm. Usually that's like HCG injections or Clomid or something like that, something that will just jumpstart your testes without giving you direct testosterone. Um, General health does matter. So if there's, if a guy is really ill, like um, Crohn's disease or, um, you know, some, some serious systemic illness or kidney disease or something like that, that can impact your sperm. So you should get a checkup with your primary care doctor. If you have a medical issue, you, you should tell your specialist that you want to tune up so that you can be as healthy as you can be. And in general, if you're healthy, you can probably always optimize your health, like a little more exercise, a little more sleep, maybe a few more vegetables, less sugar, less alcohol, smoking, vaping, marijuana, yeah, all no pot. impacts of exactly. the sperm. Stay away from heat. You don't want to sit in a hot tub, but- hot or, or And don't right. have your computer on your lap without a barrier. Yeah. And, yeah. and what about the phone? Like the phone 24 mm -hmm. seven in your front mm -hmm. pocket? Probably not a good idea. Not a great idea. Um, but- Tight bike shorts, not so it's such a big issue, really, sure. or hot showers, not really such a big issue. Um, and, you know, so those are, those are a bunch of things that you should look at. Your doctor should check a semen analysis, a karyotype, maybe a Y deletion. You should see a fertility specialist um, to talk about possibly, you know, possibly you might need IVF, maybe IUI could be helpful. And, um, and then a fertility urologist to help, you know, maybe put you on medications to help with the sperm count. But you know, it only wait takes one good sperm to make a baby. That's, so, that's the part that I felt so hopeful about is that yeah. low sperm count is not no sperm count. Right. And that, that sperm can be retrieved. 
successfully and it can be used. And yeah. so as long as those swimmers are healthy, and that's why I think you need a full semen analysis and not just look at count, but are, you know, are they swimming in the right direction? Do they have the right shape? Then, you know, that brings me a lot of hope for, you know, what their options are. Absolutely. And Absolutely. yeah, so that, the, that's the prognosis usually is really, really good. Yeah, exactly. Now, now Ginger, who had the unassisted pregnancies, total wonderful surprises, but they were unassisted. So she was just clarifying. And yes, we totally get how devastating Ginger. I, I just think at 39 with that history, um, we should get her into a fertility specialist right away. Yeah, though. I, because we do we do start to worry about age, not that you're old, but it, it does become more challenging to treat as you get older. So um, it's, it's a good idea to hear from the specialist now. It doesn't mean you have to do anything. You know, you don't want to, you don't exactly. want to do intervention. That's fine. But I think it's important to make an informed decision. That's what, that's how, how we feel about it so strongly at the company is that we do this because we believe everyone deserves access to a consult. Yeah. You know, so that you have a full, a true full understanding of all your options and your personal scenario and what's really going on with your body. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be, you know, talked into doing anything you don't want to do. It doesn't mean that, that even IVF is the only option. And I think that's, that's the part that we want to just really stress is that we're not sending you in to try to sell IVF. We're sending exactly. you in because we, there is a small amount of specialists who truly specialize in infertility cases, and we want to get you in to see them, ideally two years sooner than, than what we normally see out there in the market. Um, we do have another user, and we only have time for a couple more questions. We're running kind of long because you guys are being so engaging. We do have somebody who had three IVF ICSI failures. So at that point, yeah, that sounds really tough too. At that point, um, if she but was coming to you for a study, second opinion, five exactly. Five retrievals, you still have a decent chance of success. But I think at this point, good idea to like take a deep breath, think about like possibly different approaches, possibly general health things. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea that you had before, Alice. Mm hmm. And, and yeah, exactly. I mean, Serena, I always feel like too, that, that in, this is a tricky thing because not everybody wants so many embryos stored because they don't want to deal with having leftover embryos. You know, right. in my case, I still have five. Uh, and, but it does seem like when you start in this journey, because and some people hate the word journey too, it might take years that, that, you know, right when you begin though, is when your eggs are at their youngest. And that we should try to do maybe two or three egg retrievals before making those embryos, depending on what the, you know, the, the numbers are. I think it would be awesome if everybody could do that. But right now, uh, for many people, it's not really practical. It's number one, it's, it can be yeah. really expensive. Number two, it can be really overwhelming. Even if you have good insurance, most insurances will only work at one baby at a time. They're very against covering banking. You know, right. so even though most of my patients seem to want to have more than one child, um, the idea of banking is really seems right now to be more something I talk about a lot as opposed to actually end up doing. So even sure. my patients that are really serious about that, when they actually sit down and think about what it takes to do the banking, um, a lot of times, you know, they, they get tired or they feel like oh, it's I know. out of budget. It's, it's yep. hard. So I it don't is think, hard. Uh, we don't I mean, look, mine are, it's written into my will. I mean, I've been storing them for 12 and a half years. Wow. You know, it's written into my will, what I'm going to do. So yeah, these are tough questions. We'll do a whole episode just on that. We'll invite an attorney. Um, you're welcome, idea. CL Mayfield. You're welcome. And that also for that particular user, um, they should discuss uterine receptivity testing as well, yes. um, right? Because anybody with more than, is it more than two failed transfers? Well, it's, for it's hard. It's, it's two, two transfers with donor eggs or two mm -hmm. transfers with PGT normal embryos. If they're not PGT normal embryos, then a lot depends upon the devil's in the details. But that's right. certainly reasonable to bring up, like what's going on with the uterus. Right. Yes. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. You can ask us more questions on the Fertility Answers app. We do have all volunteer experts. They are all board certified. There's there's my miracle one. I'm wrapping it up, Dante. Um, Dr. Chen's available on there to answer questions, and but we have about 13 or 14 different types of board certified medical professionals. 
You hi, can Dante. say hi. <laughs> That's Dante. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you all for joining. We have a lot of video content available on our YouTube channel under Fertility Answers as well. We cover all kinds of topics and just keep DMing us and letting us know what you want us to cover. Tomorrow I'll be back here at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time with Dr. Raquel to talk about some naturopathic fertility stuff. And as always, we'll see Dr. Serena Chen from IRMS on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. I did it wrong again. 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time yeah. for our Monday motivation. So thanks, everybody, thanks and we'll guys. see you next time. It's so good to Thank see you, you. It's Bye. so good to see you. Bye.